Uh, people in the back, if you can hear me via the microphone, please nod. There's nodding. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be brief when it comes to me. Uh, this is the slide that I hate the most. But um, I grew up online. My teenage years were spent on a computer on the internet. So when I was going to university, I decided, well, I won't, don't want to study what I already know. So I'm going to study something else. And I studied something else. And people keep asking me about this. Uh, what's your education? My education has nothing to do with it. I studied uh, psychology. That's my bachelor's degree, educational psychology, for those who are really into details. And I have a master in what's called philosophy of technology. I decided to study what I don't know. Uh, I did, however, take the uh, introduction course to programming one and two, and that got me a job. That's not what I do. I don't program. My field of specialty, what's called abusability. When I look at your system, I'm interested to know how, what, what can go wrong with this system? How can I mess up people's life with this system? And because I am actually a nice person, I want to figure this out not to hurt people, but because I want to change it so we don't hurt people with the technology that we make. If I'm going to give you an advice when it comes to uh, having a hobby, uh, if you're going to fight, pick a fight you can win. I was stupid. I've uh, been picking a fight with a bank. Don't go after banks. That's a very bad idea. It's a bad idea because banks have money. They have money, they have lawyers, they have legislations, they have laws, they have all kinds of resources you don't. So if you want to go and start trouble with them, be prepared for them to push back. Um, yeah. It's a very uphill battle so far. Uh, I'm going to explain to you why it's an uphill battle, but I'm also going to tell you what's the problem, and I'm also going to show you uh, what is going on and why maybe the ball is rolling. So, um, in every system that we make, there will be design flaws. Some are small, some are big, some are proper security issues. Not every issue is serious. So when I spend my free time looking into other people's system, I will call it bug hunting without the bounty. There's nobody in Norway pays you money for anything. It's it's hundred percent uh, as a um, volunteer basis. Yeah, but I do this because I care about humans and I care about humans' lives and I absolutely adore people in general. There are individuals that I really loathe, but people and humans, I like them. I like you. So I spend my time thinking about what's the worst that can happen? How can this system hurt you? It's a bit of a sad state of mind to be in, so I don't recommend it for everybody. I spend a lot of time thinking about domestic violence, abuse, child abuse, grief, death, sickness, poverty, and all the other awful things that can hit someone. My main question whenever I look into things is, what would the worst person in the world do with this tech? And I hope you take a note, a mental note at least, of this, because this is my one guiding question that I think summarizes what is abusability. And uh, when I talk to tech students, I will tell them, think about this. And if your boss is not impressed by what the worst person in the world, you can show them a picture of me and say, uh, but what can she find in our system? We should fix that before she finds it. So you can do that. I give you the permission to use my picture as a threat. That's okay. Yeah. Um, I did a project uh, a while back. I did this very cute little project uh, together with Per uh, and another awesome human called Jun. Or John, that he keeps introducing himself as. But Jun in Norwegian. Um, we did a project where we tried to figure out what kind of old stuff is lying around and still operative. 
And one of the old stuff that is still ri- lying around when it comes to banking is paper forms. I know, I know. Uh, by the way, how many of you are from the US? Could you put your hand up? A living or from? Yeah, perhaps easier. How many of you are not living in the US? Awesome. <laughs> uh, but the US banking system is slightly further down the timeline than a lot of the other countries. Uh, so you may still have paper forms that are being paid attention to. But in Norway, we have paper forms that are still valid. You can fill them out and send them into the bank, but nobody's really paying attention to this. So what happened, to summarize it very fast, I got access to his account and his money. Uh, and that was fun. Thank you for the money, Per. That paid my coffee. Um, but in addition to getting access to his money, I discovered I got access to a lot of other things as well. So I started prodding around and seeing what can I do when I have access to someone's account? Uh, I think somebody will uh, drop their glasses. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, and I found a lot of small issues. Small issues are everywhere, but I also found some big issues. My problem as an external volunteer, yeah, uh, let's not say hacker uh, in this context, but yeah, as an external person, I have absolutely no leverage when it comes to the banking in Norway. I don't get to set the order of the day. I don't get to change their priorities at all. So all the big issues that I found I made a note of it, I took a screenshot of it, and I check up on the issues. Did they fix it uh, once in a while? Uh, but there's very little I can do because to change anything, I need to get somebody's attention. And it's difficult because banks don't care about you. They don't pay attention to anything that doesn't cost them money. I can, of course, go to the media. And I have done that in the past when I thought it was ethically sound and a good idea. Going to the media is not a straightforward thing to do because journalists may not understand what you're talking about and then they won't make anything out of it. That happens all the time. They will like, and like, will uh, the bank stop working? No, they won't. Then why should we write about it? You know. In addition, they absolutely love the whole story, hacker found security issues. But when I talk about my type of issues, abusability type of issues, uh, they will call the bank and they say, hey, do you have a statement? Because uh, this uh, hacker person or this security person says that you have security issues. And they will say, that's behind login. It's not a problem. They're overdoing it. It's, it's a feature. And then there's no story. So I just had to hang on to my knowledge to whenever the time is right. And the time was right a few months ago. Because one of the directors of personal banking in Norway got, made an interview in the biggest uh, news channel that we have. And she talked about his, her, her campaign about making women invest their money, not in saving accounts, but in uh, stocks and fund which is a good, that's a good project. But she was blaming women for not having a good overall insight into the uh, economy, their personal economy. And she was being, I think, pretty unfair. So I did this really old school thing called um, a reader's post where you write and you send it into a newspaper. And I chose to send it into the biggest financial newspaper in Norway. And they said, yes, thank you. And they made a huge page out of it. This is paper newspaper, but they do, did also come online. Uh, and it was great because they started to listen. And the biggest news agency who did the interview the day before called me and said, do you want to be on TV and radio in a debate with that director? And I said, of course I want to, which is terrifying because she has a team of people that will back her up and give her PR advice. And I had to complete my work day and then maybe brush my hair before I got on TV. That was 
horrible. Um, but I did. And the debate went well for me, I think. Um, and things started happening. Uh, it triggered a lot of other um, reader posts and social media and other financial institutions started to have opinions and people started calling me and things, well, the ball is starting to roll and it's great. Maybe we can have better banking for private individuals. And of course, I'm doing this talk and I'm doing one at Crypto and Privacy Village uh, together with Ped. And I'm also going to this, we'll call it a political convention. It's a weird thing. A bunch of politicians and lobbyists and journalists are meeting up. Perhaps it should be a meetup. It's called Arndar Suken. And somebody invited the new director of banking in that bank to have a debate with me. Again, great. They're starting, well, they're, I wouldn't say listen, but at least they're not ignoring me anymore. And fighting me is better in, than ignoring me. When they're fighting me, they're starting to pay attention. And also doing a national security conference in Norway, they invited us to talk and it's great. It's, we're getting somewhere. But let me talk about the issues. Because securing a bank, banks have a lot of security systems, like whole heaps of measures in place. There's a saying, I guess uh, I translated into English and I'm pretty sure you have it here as well. Uh, as secure as in the bank. Is it, does it make sense? Yeah, there's a nodding, thank you. Uh, we have that in Nor Norwegian as well. Banks are supposed to be super secure. And by the way, I love this picture because as, as a lot of you know, you don't have to open all those locks. You only need to open the one. But before you try spend time opening the one, check if the door is already open. Anyways. Um, the security measures that the bank has is not your security measures. A lot of the time, this is an overlap between your interest and their interest, because you don't want to get robbed and they don't want to be the bank that got robbed. But this talk is when it's no longer an overlap of interests about security measures that are not there, but you need. Oh yeah, you should go ahead and take pictures. I don't mind. Um, because you can get robbed even though the bank doesn't get robbed. Basic banking, if you're a single person or living in the 1970s, would be like this. You have a key to a, an account. I call it vault for this occasion. Um, but most of us live in household with other adults. Not everybody, but a lot of us. Um, if you live in a household with other adults, um, they may be your, your romantic partner, your children, or your parents or relatives in some kind. And in Norway, at least, um, we most families are two income families. It may be different where you're from. I know uh, you Americans have much more single income families than we have. Um, but it doesn't really matter um, because you are sharing your finances, even if you say that you have a split economy, because you will probably only have like one bottle of ketchup. You will have one utility bill, one internet bill, and so on. You don't have two. It doesn't make sense to have two power bills to your house. So you are sharing even if you don't intend to share. So when you've been living with the same person for a while, you build trust with them and you start realizing, well, we are sharing. So instead of having this hassle every week or month or whatever, let's share an account. It makes more sense. Oh, by the way, um, Equality. I know people disagree about equality. Um, and I don't think it matters what you think of equality. Because I think you can agree with me that um, shared access to shared assets is fair. And also, it should be possible to secure your assets if you want to. 
When I say asset, if you're the one who's making money, that will mean money. But if you're the one who's living as an adult in a household with other adults and not making money, you will probably be contributing in other ways. So your asset is the money being made to the household. That, ma that is money that matters to you. You should make, take measures so that you secure that you're not homeless or starving, right? And if you want to do that, access control to a bank is not enough. This is sharing a bank account. We call it power of attorney. Uh, sorry, attorney. Um, I keep to calling it eternity, but it's not for eternity. It's attorney. Um, it's a fun little trick, sharing a bank account like this, because in essence, there are two locks, but you only need to open one of them to get access to the money. What you get access to, you intend to share your money, probably for paying bills, food bills or uh, utility bills. But what also happens is, is that the other person or the other persons you're sharing with get access to your history. And that's fine because you may be having a new relationship. Do they need to know what you've been up to the latest 10 years? Maybe not. Um, and of course the money and depending on your local laws, um, by giving them access to one of your accounts, that is a declaration of that you have shared finances, even though you don't intend to have it. What you don't get, get access by, uh, to uh, by, with the um, power of attorney is the bills. They're still coming to that one person in that one person's name. And of course, that is very unpractical. And in the US, you get something called a joint account instead. Joint accounts are not available in every country. I have not seen them in Germany and Denmark and Norway and a few others. I only see them here. Um, I would love feedback on that. If you have joint account as a concept in your country, let me know. And also I would like the name of the bank. Joint accounts are nice because when you're setting up a joint account, you're setting up a new account. So there's no history. They don't need to know what you've been spending your money on. Um, and you're making sort of like a third legal person. When you're paying your bills, it's no longer your or the other person, but whatever that account is registered as that is paying the bills. And they can uh, receive bills as well. It's neat, it makes sense. But again, depending on your local laws, you're declaring that you have joint finances. And this matters when life gets harder. Anyways, um, joint accounts and a power of attorney will let you, uh, opens up for you to be robbed. And if that happens, you can complain all you want to the bank or your mother or whoever, but they would just tell you, well, you gave them access to your money. You gave them legal access to your money. Of course you get, get gonna get robbed. It's your problem. You trusted the wrong person. And I think that's really unfair. This is a feature, by the way. Trusting the wrong person is a feature in the banks. Because even if you trust the right person, uh, life happens. You may have changed in priorities. That may not always mean a divorce, but a lot of the time people fall in love and fall out of love or feel different about priorities in the life. Grief, when you lose someone, you, your mental state are impacted by it. Accidents happen um, that can leave the other person that was the right person no longer choosing the right things or the things that are in your both interest. And I will be very direct when it comes to illnesses because it's very common that people have either diabetes, cancer, dementia, anxiety, addictions, depressions, and a whole other things that it will affect their mental capacity to making good financial decisions. 
So even if you chose the right person, the love of your life, this can unfortunately still happen to you. And they can also be um, scanned. So we need more measures in place in banking that take care of your interest, not just the bank's interests. To add insult to injury, banks have this. They have account types that have all the measures that you want, that have double signing or triple signing even if you want, that have transaction limits, daily limits, monthly limits, weekly limits, and so on. They have alarms. They have notifications. So you can have uh, either on email or on your phone or wherever, even in your banking app. Uh, and they have logging, logs of who logged on and did what. But you don't get access to it as a private person. You only get access to it if you are a business. You don't have to be a big business. You can be a really small business. You can earn less than your household and you still get access to this if you're a business. And I think that is unfair. And I want this for private, personal banking. If you have a bank that do any of this for personal accounts, I would love to know. Because in order to, well, win or at least make the fight harder for the bank where I'm at, I would like a good role model or um, a little peer pressure to put them under so that they uh, give me this because I know Technically speaking, this is quite possible. It's just a matter of priorities. So yeah, um, that was it. I, I, I was super fast this time. Do you have any questions? Yes. Um, I, can, I can make mention about some of the banking issues that could be Thank you. One of the things that I find that's in our country that is a, a banking issue, and no offense to any parents here, but when your parent, um, when you want to initiate a banking, I remember one of my friends, she was 17. Uh, she had to have her parents sign for it. Um, now that that person, I think she's in her 50s, uh, till this day, she can't get her mom removed. So, of course, her mom is asking her, you know, uh, what did you spend that hundred dollars on? And, you know, it's kind of uh, annoying to her, not me, but her. And um, that's something that, you know, she's banked with this company or this banking system for over 40 years. But she she can't get her mom removed. Yeah. So uh, I think that's that's an issue and vice versa. If you have a person who a child and you open an account with them for 17 years and they still have that banking account and that person is um, is not very stable in their finances, overdraft, you know, all matters of issues, then that parent is still signed to that account. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing you're in the U.S. Yes. Yes. Uh, you have a credit system here that is um, different um, than other countries. Uh, first of all, uh, when you grow up or if your life changed a lot, start over when it comes to banking in the sense that get another bank because that's how you sanitize access. Um, trying to tell the bank that they should do something different. They don't listen. I'm sorry they don't listen. Uh, start over. Uh, be a good consumer. Threaten them. Tell, go to another bank and say, you know what, um, give me a good offer. You may not always be in the position where it's um, you you are the best uh, customer, but they don't know that yet. So try, be bold. Um, yes. The last comment question was actually kind of tied to um, my thoughts around the credit scoring, the, the credit scoring system here. So in that case, if she starts fresh, right, her credit tanks because it's based off age of accounts too here for different FICO levels. 
Yeah. Because FICO sucks. I hate FICO. Yeah. If you want to talk to me about FICO, I plan to have a rage campaign against it. <laughs> but it's another story. But as far as like credit scoring and, and say, I'm sorry, Norway, right? Yeah. So how does that, how does like account age and stuff like that impact accounts in like Norway? And I don't, I don't know what the credit system looks like there, but I assume it's better. Very I, different. Okay. Um, yeah. But I can talk a little bit about it because sure. um, in Norway we have a, well, first of all, we have a um, credit system where you can, um, you have a credit score there, but it's only available for businesses usually, and they have to have a solid good reason for checking your credit. We also have a registry for all your debt. We didn't used to have that, but now we have that. Uh, it is so that you cannot take up a lot of credit around everywhere and be deeply in debt um, because it's unfair to put you in that position. Uh, and it's also very unfair to put your loved ones and people you're sharing your economy with in that position. Um, so we have that. Um, both in Norway and in every other country I've talked to or people, um, as a romantic partner, I cannot do a credit check of my uh, love interest. Um, I'm not sure if you should be able to, but it's an interesting thought to follow through uh, or think about. Um, because when you're starting a relationship, you're entering it with trust, and that trust may not be, um, um, what we call it, uh, valid or uh, reasonable? Warranted, thank you. Um, so yeah, on the other hand, it's very important for personal freedom to be able to take up credit without your current romantic partner or parents know about it, because you may need those money to get away. Domestic violence, uh, financial violence is a huge part of it. Um, so it's not an easy thing to change things, but I will support you if you want to riot for a better solution. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and also when you're changing bank, you can do it slowly, like uh, ghosting them. You don't have to do it like on day one. Just ghost them slowly. Hi. Um so I guess for your last slide, what I guess what I'm trying to take away from it is, you know, a lot of fintechs now have that for personal accounts, even um, where I work does the same. Um, I, I guess what are you trying to like gain out of that? Because uh, for your your last example, a lot of that would show that someone's trying to set money aside if they're trying to escape a situation uh, like you have all the like, where do you want that line? So, um the line is a whole debate uh, because it depends on your local laws and it depends on um, other contexts uh, like your income and how that is in so on. Um, but one important part of this is that if both need for everyday money, like for cash, like pocket money and so on, you can have your own account. That's not a big deal. But for savings, um, it's kind of absurd that my spouse can take all our savings and run away with them or drink them up or buy that bloody motorcycle um, without me knowing and approving. So if both have to sign for things, uh, don't do that for all your money. That will be insanely impractical, but do it for the huge amounts. And yes, then you end up in a debate where you probably will have to divide assets called a divorce or a splitting of assets um, if you cannot agree. But if you cannot agree, you're not agreeing. But at least one person is not robbing the other one and leaving them without any money. Um, yeah. Oh, and by the way, this happens so many times. Hi, Cecile. Yeah. Great presentation. Thank you. Yours too, Per. Very nice. Um, I just happened to live in Norway and we had the chance to meet before. I was just wondering during your presentation, it came to my mind if you have any insight from uh, related to abusability applied to the bank ID system. Have you, would you have any thought to share? And if, of, of course, if you could just spare, uh, spend like 30 seconds explaining to people what bank ID is, which in my opinion is pretty ro robust. Yeah, so bank idea is the um, ex 
Well, I, I was the CISO for Bank ID for three years. <laughs> that was my previous job. Bank, Bank ID in Norway is uh, the system that all Norwegians are using to identify not only to banks, but all to every single government service you can think of, and insurance companies and so more. Bank ID has 95% market share in Norway, at least, so it's the solution being used. Uh, and it's a digital solution, ID solution, uh, that comes in, in uh, two levels, a high and, should I say, uh, medium security, um, and you use that. And as an example, when I sort of, we, we did our little attack that we are also going to talk about at the Krypton Privacy Village at DEF CON on Friday, um, I was, you know, um, I wanted Cecilia to obtain legal access to my account, but we didn't want to do anything illegal. Uh, so I asked, would you like uh, access to my account and my money? And she happily accepted that. We fill out a paper form on one single, uh, one single sheet of paper with uh, my information and her information and two witnesses that were absolutely clueless to what they were signing for. We sent the paper form to the bank and suddenly she got access. And uh, additional bonus, after the access had been set up, I didn't receive any message from bank from my bank that they had given her access, and she didn't receive any information either from them, like a text message, email, or anything, that she had access to my account. And after I gave her account, I suddenly realized, shit, I have 10 years of payment history on that account as well, and she can see everything, all the money I have ever received and all the money I have spent for anything. That was like, okay, well, so you're a good, trusted friend, uh, but... <laughs> Facebook would love that info. Yeah. So she's going to auction that off later on today, I guess, my <laughs> personal information. Yeah. But yeah, that's the bank ID system. Uh, and from there... It's yeah. uh, it's interesting to see that you still need alternatives like paper forms for people that are not digital, people that cannot use bank ID for many different reasons, like having a legal guardian being sick. Uh, we still have, you know, uh, uh, one challenge to us is, as an example, we are taking in quite a few uh, Ukrainian re refugees and they are not immediately allowed to have bank ID because we don't have any credit history, we don't know who they are, it's difficult to verify their identity, so we don't give them immediate access to using bank ID as an example. And then we have paper forms. Yeah, um, there's, there's a lot of good reason to have paper forms, for now anyway. Uh, the EU is doing a very interesting project that if you have a passport uh, and you have an established ID, uh, you also get a digital ID. Uh, Bank Idea has been doing that for 95% of the population in Norway for a while, but the last five is still a significant amount of people. Um, so there's there there needs to be something done for them. And for for now, they're living on their parents' accounts or uh, other relatives or romantic partners and so on and so on. And it's a mess. It's not a good mess. Um, and I accept that paper forms has a function, but nobody's paying attention to them. So that's a problem. Um, but most of all, uh, there is no way that I can give anyone a little bit of access to my money. It's either nothing at all or everything. And that is too binary. Um, yeah. Do you know, do you know, raise your hand. Do you know anyone, any business, or any corporation, any government organization that actually verifies written signatures on a piece of paper? Oh, that's fun. Um, one. One. Two, uh, three. Okay, yeah, we haven't seen anyone in Norway yeah. for several years. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the fun parts of that project. That was, uh, I was signing this paper and they're going to, well, if they, was checking my, if they were checking my signatures, against what? When I was five? Um, <laughs> it didn't make sense at all because we have digital banking, so much digital banking. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was... And that was when fun. I was going to fill out the paper form, I, I looked around my entire apartment. I didn't have a single pen. I haven't used a pen for, for many years. I'm all digital. So oh, yeah. I had to go out and buy a pen to fill out a paper form just trying to do social engineering against the bank. It's, we don't do so, that yeah. anymore. Yeah. Uh, the future, uh, two things. Uh, you can find me on socials and everything. Uh, LinkedIn is probably the easiest way to get in contact with me if you want to. I would love to drink coffee and have conversations with you. Um, but also I'm hoping the banks will start giving me at least 
a way of making two signatures happen because it's possible. Um, and uh, also, I'm hoping with modern banking that maybe my next bank is not a Norwegian one, but a German one who possibly may have maybe maybe these uh, control measures in place. I don't know, but I think um, I think banks are in deep water. Uh, it's a global market now. Yeah. Thank you, Cecilia.